Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Washington Gun Law TV. I'm Washington Gun Law President William Kirk. Thanks for joining us. Hey, today is the first Tuesday of October. What does that mean? It means that the United States Supreme Court is now back in session. Now, we have a couple of huge cases on the merits docket for this year. We're going to talk about both of them because they have a chance to significantly change the Second Amendment landscape forever. In addition to that, though, we thought we might want to make some suggestions to our nine justices on the Supreme Court about some other matters that probably need some pretty quick resolution, and we'd kind of like to have them accept review. So today, let's geek out about the Supreme Court for a little bit, and let's talk about the two huge cases before the United States Supreme Court. Okay, here's what we're talking about. We're talking about the United States Supreme Court. Why? It's the first Tuesday of October. They are back in session and they will begin hearing cases. Now listen, there are two huge cases we need to talk about both of them. One of them already has an argument date set. The other one is yet to be uh, set. Um, one of them is getting all of the attention, but I really think we also need to pay equal attention to the other one. Of course, the case that is getting all the attention is United States v. Rahimi. Now, that is an appeal from the Fifth Circuit. That is a very, very fascinating case. Mr. Rahimi was ordered to forfeit firearms due to allegations of violent felonies. Mr. Rahimi declined to forfeit those firearms and was subsequently charged with being under indictment and being in possession of the firearms. Mr. Rahimi actually challenged the constitutionality of law, 18 United States Code Section 922. The Fifth Circuit found that there was no historical analog which forced the person to forfeit their Second Amendment rights based merely on an allegation, complaint, or indictment and actually found that portion of 18 U.S.C. 922 unconstitutional. The United States government has appealed. The United States Supreme Court has accepted review. Now, we'll be doing other videos as we get a little bit closer where we're going to look into our crystal ball and make some pretty bold predictions here. I will tell you right now that I honestly do believe that the Fifth Circuit is going to be reversed by the United States Supreme Court. I do not believe that the United States Supreme Court would have accepted this case with the notion of affirming the Fifth Circuit. We will dig deeper into that when we get closer to the oral argument date, which right now is set for November 7th. So United States v. Rahimi is set for November 7th before all nine justices in the United States Supreme Court. Now the other case, and this is a case that we actually geeked out on on this video right here, is a case called Loper Bright Enterprises versus Ramondo. It's a, an appeal out of the DC Circuit Court. It has to do with the fishing industry. And so you sit there and go, why the hell are we talking about this at Washington Gun Law? I'll tell you exactly why. Because the whole issue there is that the fishing industry was allowed to put inspectors onto fishing vessels and then require the fishing vessels to pay the salaries of the government inspectors. It was based upon how the fishing industry or how the regulatory industry had interpreted all of the regulations that govern the fishing industry. Put other ways, the regulatory agency was given the Chevron deference. That is, they were given great leeway, great deference to interpret the statutes however they saw fit. The question before the United States Supreme Court is whether or not the Chevron deference should even exist as a legal doctrine, or does it in fact violate the separation of powers because it allows an executive branch agency, Article 2, to conduct an Article 3 function, which is interpret the meaning of statutes. So the case, once again, is Loper Bright Enterprises v. Romando. Everyone needs to pay careful attention because what's another agency that has used the Chevron deference ad nauseum to their benefit? Oh, that's right. It's the ATF. And in fact, you see many of these arguments, pistol brace rule, frames and receivers. You're going to see it again with the FFL rule and what constitutes an FFL, that the ATF routinely wants to support their arguments through the use of the Chevron deference. So that is a huge case to watch. Those are the two cases that are on the docket that we're going to have to carefully watch. Now, I doubt that any of the nine justices from the United States Supreme Court are watching Washington Gun Law. I'm sure you all have better things to do. But if by chance somebody who has the ear of any one of those justices, uh, let me give you some suggestions for other matters that need to be accepted for review within the next 12 months, okay? 
assault weapon bans, okay? We are seeing a divergence of opinions. We are seeing many states, including my state, Washington, which even though Bruin came out, essentially thumbed their nose at the United States Supreme Court and passed an assault weapon ban. We are seeing a wide array of opinions, a wide array of legal theories, and it is very obvious when you take a look at states like California, New York, Washington, and especially what they did in Illinois, that this issue needs to be resolved once and for all. Now, everyone really who understands simple English understands the common use doctrine announced in Heller. And apparently, though, there are some very bright justices throughout the country who have never either read that or simply can't understand the common use doctrine. There are three cases. Any one of these three cases, the United States Supreme Court could accept and we would be halfway home. And that is Miller v. Bonta out of California, Harold v. Raul out of Illinois, or Bianchi v. Frosch out of Maryland. Supreme Court, except any one of those three cases. Now, Bianchi v. Frosch has actually been GVR'd back down to Maryland, and of course, they're sitting on it. Magazine bans, my God, we need to resolve the issue of magazine bans once and for all because we actually have some justices out there right now ruling that magazines are not even protected by the Second Amendment, okay? And then we have other matters such as Duncan v. Bonta, which clearly show that they are protected by the Second Amendment. Now, we know the Ninth Circuit is going to be sitting on that case as long as they possibly can. The Supreme Court needs to step in. You need to accept a magazine review case. You need to do so immediately. Duncan v. Bonta certainly has the most thorough record. And so that is the case that we would highly recommend the United States Supreme Court accept review of. The prohibition against marijuana users and firearms found in 18 United States Code section 922 G3. This is a big issue that is beginning to bubble up. Why? Well, because we have almost half the states in the United States now have legalized cannabis and shockingly, society has not come unraveled in the seams in any one of those states. Yet there still is a federal prohibition against it. There is no political will to change the scheduling of cannabis. And so therefore we must begin to analyze the constitution of the prohibition against cannabis users. I'm not talking about people who are high on marijuana at the time they're possessing firearms. That's no different than alcohol. But because a person occasionally uses cannabis, either for recreational or for medicinal purposes, should they be banned from exercising their otherwise inalienable right? The case for the United States Supreme Court to accept on that one, of course, is the United States v. Daniels, a case that we've already geeked out about right here. And that is the case that we would love to see the United States Supreme Court accept review of. Finally, nonviolent felons and their right to possess firearms. So we are dealing with Rahimi, which is going to deal with allegations, pre-conviction allegations of a violent felony. But what about all those people back in their 20s who got busted on some drug charge, who got busted on some other felony that had no violence, no sex offense, nothing like that involved. And now they are federally precluded from ever being able to restore their firearm rights. Is that the framers intent? Was that our founders intent? When you go back and you take a look, there is not a really rich historical analog of restricting firearms from people who merely were felons. Dangerous felons, people that society deemed as dangerous, that's a whole nother story. But there are a multitude of felonies in which a person can be charged with that doesn't necessarily mean they're a dangerous individual. It may mean that they're addicted on a substance. It may mean that they're a dishonest person, a crook or something like that. But it does not necessarily mean that they're a sex offender or worse yet, even a violent individual. So we have United States v. Rahimi. We have Loper Bright Enterprises v. Ramondo. Those are the two cases that are on this year's Supreme Court docket. What I am begging the justices at the United States Supreme Court to do in the next 12 months is to accept review of an assault weapon ban case, whether that's Miller v. Bonta, Harold v. Raul, Bianchi v. Frosch, I don't really care. Please accept the review of a magazine ban case. Duncan v. Bonta would be an excellent one. Please accept review on the prohibition on marijuana users and firearms as discussed in the United States v. Daniels. And finally, we do need to answer the question about whether nonviolent felons, once they've served their debt to society, should be allowed to restore their firearms. The appropriate case to take on that one up for review by the United States Supreme Court is the case of Range versus Attorney General of the United States that came out of the Third Circuit. 
Listen, as we get closer to the oral argument dates on Rahimi, we'll start doing some videos where we'll start talking about what's going to happen there and what our predictions will be. In the meantime, if you guys have any questions about what's going on at the Supreme Court or anything else related to what's left of our Second Amendment rights, you guys should know how to get a hold of Washington Gun Law by now. But if you don't, that's okay. That information is down there in the description box also. In the meantime, let's everyone remember now that part of being the lawful and responsible gun owner, like we talk about all the time here, is to know what the law is in every situation, how it applies to you in any instance that you may find yourself. Until next time, thanks for watching and stay safe.